No, thank you. So uh, I said that I'm very proud to be um, here today for the uh, event that we have organized to launch the International Center for the Prosecution of the Crime of Aggression Against Ukraine, the so-called ICPA. And uh, let me first use this opportunity to thank you, just and the President Ladislav Amram for all the efforts to um, make the quick setup of the ICPA possible. And it's thanks to them and the other partners present here uh, today that we can set this first important step to ensure accountability for the international crimes committed during Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. And today's launch of the uh, ICPA is an important testimony of our commitment to the global fight against impunity. We cannot tolerate the gross violation of the prohibition of the use of force, one of the fundamental rules of the international rule-based order and a bedrock principle of the UN Charter. It is specifically in times in which these fundamental principles are so fiercely challenged that we are obliged to stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes. Since the very beginning of the war, Eurojust has been at the very forefront of the EU's efforts to provide Ukraine with necessary means to ensure that the perpetrators of this war do not go unpunished. It has done so by supporting the establishment of the joint investigation team comprising Ukraine, Lithuania, and Poland as its members. And by now, Estonia, Latvia, Slovakia, and Romania have all joined the JIT in addition, the International Criminal Court, which is present here today, also participates in this JIT, and we have organized a very good collaboration with our colleagues from the United States. With the ICPA, Eurojust will provide a structure to support and enhance the national investigations into the crime of aggression against Ukraine and coordinate closely with the um, investigations of the International Criminal Court for crimes that fall within the court's jurisdictions. Through the um, ICPA, Eurojust will support national authorities in securing, storing, and analyzing evidence and building cases for future trials. Eurojust's new core international crimes evidence database, developed after the extension of its mandate last year, will further contribute to this important exercise, very important to store with a very high level of uh, security, all the evidence and then to exchange those evidence with all the prosecutors at the national level or in international jurisdictions. The member states will play a crucial role in collecting evidence, identify witnesses and possible suspects, in executing arrest warrants, including those issued by the International Criminal Court, and in ensuring that the perpetrators of such hideous crimes cannot hide from justice. It is clear that in our efforts to ensure full accountability for the crimes committed in Ukraine, the importance of coordination and cooperation between all national and international justice actors cannot be overestimated. The ICPA will function as an essential piece to ensure accountability compl complementary to the existing accountability framework. Let me just conclude my intervention by highlighting that it's only through a joint and comprehensive approach that we can achieve full accountability. And this is the essence of the ICPA. And I'm therefore delighted that the center is taking this up meeting this number is not valid, or Today the meeting has not yet started. It's the first step. Enter the meeting number to, uh, followed by such pound. A, a center into place, it will be possible to collect evidence to prepare prosecutions, but of course we need to find a place to organize a trial about the crime of aggression, and we'll continue the discussions about that. I'm just hoping that in the future, it will be possible to amend the Rome Statute to give such a competence to the International Criminal Court. It's the normal way for the future. But for the moment, you know that we continue some discussions about the creation of a jurisdiction where it will be possible to organize a trial about the crime of aggression, a dedicated tribunal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Henders. Mr. Hamran, if you would like to take the floor, please. 
Thank you so much, um, dear ladies and gentlemen. Also, very well welcome on uh, my behalf. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us uh, here uh, in The Hague. Um, over the past uh, 20 years, Eurojust has uh, built up a very solid track record in providing operational, technical, logistical, and financial support this to meeting number national is not investigations, valid, or the meeting national not prosecutors yet working on uh, cross-border cases. Number, followed From by the pound. very beginning uh, of the war in Ukraine, we have been at the forefront of uh, the accountability efforts, uh, working side by uh, side with the Ukrainian uh, prosecutor's general's office. We helped to set up the joint investigation uh, team uh, focused on international crimes committed in uh, Ukraine, and we also introduced a, a core international crime uh, evidence uh, database. And uh, for some uh, weeks already, uh, we have been receiving uh, submissions. Uh, up to now, uh, we have uh, uh, submissions uh, from uh, 10 uh, countries already, and uh, many uh, will follow. A crucial next step of uh, this journey is setting up uh, the International Center for the Prosecution of the Crime of uh, Aggression, which is a unique uh, international cooperation platform uh, without any uh, precedent in uh, legal uh, history. Uh, the ICPA will support national uh, investigators and prosecutors from Ukraine, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland who are investigating the crime uh, of uh, aggression. They will be working uh, from these premises where they will, be, uh, will benefit uh, from our state-of-art uh, analytical, legal, financial, and uh, logistical uh, support. As it was uh, already uh, mentioned, the key purpose of uh, having the International Center for the Prosecution of the Crime of Aggression is to secure crucial evidence, start building up the case already now. Uh, we don't want to wait until the end of uh, the conflict. Uh, we decided that we will support our partners which uh, uh, started their own national investigations and we will uh, centralize already available evidence, analyze that evidence and also identify possible evidentiary gaps uh, through our experts working uh, here at Eurojust. We will also translate evidence and uh, relevant documents into both Ukrainian and English uh, to ensure that they can be used before different national jurisdictions as well as uh, national courts. Finally, uh, it's uh, no coincidence uh, that we are joined here today by the prosecutor of the ICC, Mr. Khan, and the Assistant Attorney General of the United States, Mr. Polit. In addition to ICCs and uh, US, uh, other countries will relevant evidence or information and organization, such as uh, EU advisory mission to Ukraine, are expected to join uh, the uh, ICPA in coming months. We believe that through these united international efforts, we hope that the International Center for the Prosecution of the Crime of Regression will become a symbol of our unwavering commitment to uphold the rule of law and bring an end to impunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hamran. Mr. Kostin, may I ask you to take the floor, please? Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to echo what was already said by Commissioner Reinders and President Hamran. Today, we gather here on occasion of a truly historic moment. I would say an epoch-defining moment when the civilized world not only voices but also shows by concrete actions that accountability is what matters the most. Today marks the day when we have launched the operation of the International Center for the Prosecution of the Crime of Aggression. The Center housed in Eurojust premises. And I would like to thank my dear friend Ladislav for all his efforts. Is the mechanism that will facilitate and support national judicial investigations into the crime of aggression in the member states that participate in our joint investigation team. This is the framework within which we will exchange information, expertise, evidence, in relation to the crime of aggression. 
and will design and implement a common investigative and prosecutorial strategy. The team of our four prosecutors from Ukraine are now in The Hague and start their work from today. The work of the center will contribute to the efficient and comprehensive investigation and prosecution of the crime of aggression, which is an original scene, commission of which opened the floodgate for 100,000 of other international crimes, including targeted killing of civilians, sexual violence, torture, forcible displacement of civilians, including of children, looting, and many others. Russia's aggression against Ukraine and its continuous use of force against sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence that threatened Ukraine's very existence is not only directed against my country. It stands as a global threat to peace, security, and stability. For this reason, it is paramount to display our preparedness that accountability for the crime of aggression is a central tenant of our political, legal, and moral agenda. We all know that crime of aggression is a leadership crime and is a remaining weak spot in the international criminal justice architecture. However, the international law and relevant mechanisms need to reflect and respond to the modern day realities and challenges. The possibility to develop and reinvigorate them is in our own hands. And today we showed an example, which is only the first step that will allow us to streamline our international efforts to facilitate investigation and prosecution of this supreme international crime. As I said this morning, justice gives rise to peace. There can be no peace without arm of justice reaching to all planners, all architects of this crime that has threatened not only Ukraine's sovereignty and freedom, but stability and functionality of international security and legal system. Therefore, I'm confident that the result of our work will have a long-standing effect and will contribute to the strengthening of accountability system on international level. I thank each and every of my colleagues, dear friends and collaborators that have contributed to the establishment of the International Center for the Prosecution of the Crime of Aggression. We stand and will stand united for justice. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Kostin, and by now the connection is uh, re-established, I've understood. Mr. Khan, if you would like to take the floor, please. Well, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, firstly, thank you so much for making the time to um, come uh, here to Eurojust today to hear this, this press conference. It was just over a year ago, in April of last year, when for the first time in the history of the ICC, we joined the joint investigative team that had been established in relation to allegations of crimes that were being committed in Ukraine. And what motivated me to join that JIT as a participant was not only the hospitality and the welcome of President Ladislav Hamran, the good collegial support that was developing from uh, the Commissioner Didier Reinders, who's next to me in the Commission, and the shared values but a realization that for justice to work, it's predicated up upon partnerships. Partnerships with state parties, partnerships with non-state party, uh, parties, partnerships with civil society, and better communication, because we are in a world in which there is a very imperfect application of the law. Instead of wringing our hands and lamenting it, we need to play our part to make it stronger and apply it with more consistency. Now, what led to the joining of the JIT last April as a participant is the same motivation that led us to uh, join today the International Center for the Prosecution of the Crime of Aggression. We can't hope to achieve accountability anywhere under any national authority, and we know about the principle of complementarity, unless evidence is preserved, unless it is collected, unless it is well understood. And this really is the, I think, the scheme of the ICPA to 
work with the joint investigative team, which already has proved its worth in terms of uh, allegations of war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. Uh, we didn't convene this for a photo opportunity or to have the opportunity, the wonderful opportunity to speak to members of the, uh, the media. It really is an intent to make sure the law is of increasing relevance around the world and now in relation to Ukraine, to people that need it, people that are dispossessed, that are refugees, that are living in fear, that have mourned the loss of their loved ones uh, moving forward. And I think this ability to uh, collect information regarding the crime of aggression, in addition to the other core crimes that come within the ICC's jurisdiction, is one that we had to uh, grasp. Now, I couldn't agree more with uh, the statement of Didier Reinders, the Commissioner of Justice of the European Union. The natural home for the crime of aggression is the Rome Statute. It's the, uh, an amendment to the Rome Statute that allows the law to be applied with principle equally and applying to all state parties uh, you know, effectively. Now, that's for others to work with, but I think this uh, initiative, uh, with the support of the United States, again, as a non-state party, is a testament to the reawakening, the wake-up moment that we need to make sure we do better. Uh, by any analysis, Ukraine does not represent the first act of aggression that has taken place since the end of the Second World War. But we have to try to strive and find a way for our future generations, for peace and stability in the world, that the provisions of the UN Charter, the foundational principle of the UN Charter, which is the Pacific settlement of disputes and the prohibition on the crime of aggression, is something that we need to etch chisel into the architecture so it's no longer um, a concept that is frozen in time in terms of uh, crimes against peace that was prosecuted in Nuremberg with the great opening speech of uh, Rupert ja Robert Jackson and uh, the other uh, prosecutors and the Nuremberg judgment. When I say that everybody has a role to play, that there's no place for spectators, it's, it's very true. Um, at the ministerial that was co-hosted by myself and the foreign minister of the Netherlands uh, last year, we announced a, a dialogue group. The prosecutor general of Ukraine, uh, Andrei Kostin, and the fantastic work he and his uh, colleagues are doing, uh, we kicked that off uh, last week um, in terms of trying to coordinate with other actors in the United Nations, international organizations, uh, and of course the European uh, entities and national authorities, so we know what each other are doing in broad terms and we don't duplicate. We've worked together in terms of trying to embrace civil society. Uh, last week, uh, the European Ombudsperson gave an award to the publication that my office produced along with Eurojust and the Genocide Network to give guidance to civil society. So this is the beginning of a process. Um, it requires further effort, it requires focus, but I think it is meaningful. And I think the most important thing is for us, together with the help of other state parties, non-state parties, international organizations, uh, and many of those watching uh, this uh, press conference, is to make sure that when the microphones are turned off, we don't get diverted from our fundamental responsibility at this moment in time to make sure the law is felt as relevant to those people in need of it the most. As I've said repeatedly, you know, we're not on the side of Ukraine. We're on the side of justice. We are independent and impartial, and we need to find common cause with anybody that wishes to have a world for our children, for our futures, with less crime and more justice. And I think this represents an important step in that um, ultimate destination that we have to perspire and suffer and work towards reaching. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Mr. Khan. Mr. Polite, may I ask you to take the floor, please? Good morning. The United States Department of Justice is proud to stand with our European partners and to be among the first to participate in the International Center for the Prosecution of the Crime of Aggression Against Ukraine. I want to thank everyone who has played a role in launching the ICPA, including my close friends and colleagues assembled here on the stage with me. The ability of Eurojust to operationalize the concept of this center within months is absolutely remarkable. 
and it demonstrates the ingenuity of this exceptional agency. The Justice Department's newly appointed U.S. Special Prosecutor for the Crime of Aggression, Jessica Kim, will represent the United States at the center, and she will have unfettered access to the substantial body of expertise and resources that the department has amassed in response to Russia's unlawful war of aggression against the people of Ukraine. The ICPA is the most recent addition to the ecosystem for investigating and prosecuting atrocity crimes committed in Ukraine. And the center complements other domestic, regional, and international efforts to promote accountability and to combat impunity. Just two weeks ago, our Attorney General Merrick Garland visited The Hague so that he could see and observe firsthand the robust response to Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine by our Dutch partners and at Eurojust, Europol, and the International Criminal Court, indeed becoming the first Attorney General to visit the ICC. During his first visit, the Attorney General pledged that the United States would contribute to the Eurojust core international crimes evidence database. And I am proud to announce that last week, the United States made its initial contribution to this very important database. It will not be our last. So today, we honor the launch of the ICPA. Tomorrow, we roll up our sleeves and get back to work. And together, we will pursue justice no matter how long it takes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Polit. We now have time for questions. Uh, we will take a bit more time for this uh, in view of uh, the, the technical error we had before. Who would like to? Uh, a question from Agence France Press, please. Could you use the microphone, sorry? Um, yeah, uh, Danny Kemp from uh, Agence France Press. Um, a question for Mr. Polit, if I may. Um, uh, I mean, you, you, you mentioned the uh, the Attorney General's visit last week, historic visit last week to the uh, recently to the ICC. Um, uh, you're, you know, you and you're talking today about how you're uh, working now with the uh, with ICPA. Can you explain why you were prepared to work with ICPA and not uh, to be a member state of the ICC, which is, after all, investigating war crimes in Ukraine? Thanks. Thank you, Danny. And again. The United States believes in the fundamental mission of the ICPA. Uh, we are committed to helping to develop and build significant cases against those leaders who have prepared, initiated, funded, uh, and perpetrated these tremendous efforts of aggression against the Ukrainian people. We also support all mechanisms of ensuring accountability and justice whether it is regional, national, international actors. That includes our colleagues at the International Criminal Court. It includes our colleagues at the United Nations. Uh, we are confident that we can support all of those actors uh, without necessarily being a member uh, of the Rome Statute. Thank you, Mr. Polite. Uh, we have a question here from Reuters. Anthony Deutsch here. Um, Mr. Reinders, you mentioned that the center will prepare prosecutions. Um, I'd like to ask specifically, though, will the center actually identify suspects and will it be able to prepare indictments? Thank you. First of all, I want maybe to uh, repeat what I've said before. In our work, what we try to do is to provide all the necessary tools for the prosecutors to do their jobs or to organize investigations and prosecutions, and also uh, to the tribunals and the courts to uh, do the same, to be able to organize a trial and to decide. I'm saying that because I don't want to, uh, of course, organize the independent process of the prosecutors and then of the, the judges. But what we try to do here is first to be sure it's possible to collect evidence also of the crime of aggression. That's an important element. Mm -hmm. And if we are collecting such a kind of evidence, it's possible to store those evidence in your just in the new database, and to exchange then the um, evidence with all the different prosecutors in charge for a possible prosecution, because you know that there are some possibilities at the national level to do that, yeah. not only in a future possible delicate tribunal that's possible to create, but also at the national level. 
For the rest, is it possible to go so far? I will ask maybe to Ladis Das Abraham to say more about the internal job of the uh, uh, joint investigation team first and now the uh, ICPA that we, have, we are creating. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Um, uh, a direct uh, reply to your uh, question is that uh, the center uh, is not going to have uh, direct investigative uh, powers. Uh, therefore, the center itself uh, is not able to issue arrest warrants or uh, to uh, file indictments. How uh, the mechanics uh, of uh, the system will work, actually, um, as I mentioned, uh, it will be a coordination platform. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, we have today five countries which have their own national investigation concerning the crime of aggression based on their national law. Uh, these countries are Latvia, Lithuania, uh, Poland, Estonia, and obviously uh, Ukraine. So uh, we want to utilize uh, those uh, investigators and prosecutors, um, and uh, we will uh, build up a new level, a central level, which will coordinate uh, the investigations in those countries. Uh, we will, our ambition is to centralize already available evidence in database, in one database, and uh, we will analyze already collected uh, evidence in order to assess uh, whether uh, different elements of crime are sufficiently uh, documented. Um, obviously, we want to avoid over-documentation. Uh, we want to uh, make sure that uh, we use our resources uh, wisely, but we also would like to ensure that we identify in an early stage possible evidentiary gaps. And uh, with our international partners, uh, we will be able to identify uh, evidence, pieces of evidence, which are located in different jurisdictions and to make sure that uh, those pieces of evidence are gathered uh, in an admissible uh, way through existing judicial cooperation uh, channels. So um, really realize uh, the uh, ICPA as a coordination mechanism, coordination platform, which will provide additional support um, in ensuring that uh, we build up internationally a case which will then be presented either at national courts or in any future or existing uh, international courts. Thank you, Mr. Hamram. We have a question which has come in online from ZDF, German public broadcaster. Uh, will there be um, uh, a link uh, or cooperation with the work of the Council of Europe and the register they created in May? Mr. Renders. Uh, we took part at the open uh, level in the Open Commission in the creation of such a claims register in the uh, auspice of the uh, Council of Europe because it's very important for another kind of uh, goal that we have uh, to start with such a kind of process. I've said many times that we have two main goals. The first one is to bring all the perpetrators of uh, international crimes before justice, but the second one is to be sure that Russia will pay for the reconstruction and for the compensation of damages caused by uh, the Russian aggressions against Ukraine. And what we are doing now is to build such a claims register to collect all the different uh, uh, claims. Then the second step will be uh, to create a commission uh, to analyze the different claims and to decide what are the possible consequences of such a kind of uh, claim. And then, of course, we need to fund uh, uh, possible mechanisms to uh, organize a compensation, and on that we are working uh, very hard, of course. But it's a, a separate approach than what we are discussing here about the uh, international crimes, and certainly the crime of aggression. It's more to uh, be uh, able to organize a real compensation process for the people having had uh, damage caused by the Russian aggression. And you know that now we are working about, working about the funding of such a, a mechanism with, uh, first of all, uh, the way to uh, not only freeze assets of oligarchs and entities on the sanction list, but maybe to organize a confiscation of part of those assets if there is a criminal offense linked to uh, the uh, sanction list and the people on the sanction list, and that's true uh, decision in justice. It's already the case in the US. We have seen the first decision in the U.S. for $5 million, if I were informed, and we are working with the member states to do the same at the EU level, uh, to find against violation of <laughs> sanctions. And then we discuss about the possible use of the profits made on the um, Russian assets uh, to uh, fund 
such a mechanism to, to Ukraine. I'm thinking about the 207 billion euros that it was possible to immobilize in Europe, so reserve the Central Bank of Russia and other assets in Euroclear or in Cleadstream. And there, if there are some profits, we are working on the possibility to take over the profits and to uh, uh, organize such a funding process. I'm speaking about uh, around 3 billion uh, euro per year, if we are thinking about those uh, uh, profits. But we are not yet there. We are in the final discussions to see if it's possible to mobilize such a kind of uh, revenue uh, for the beginning of the funding of the reconstruction and the compensation of damages. Thank you, Mr. Anders. We have a question from Associated President and another online question. Mr. Polite, Mike Corder from the Associated Press. You mentioned that you have, uh, the U.S. has already handed over evidence to the international database. Can you elaborate at all on that? And does the Pentagon support that? And just uh, one other point. What is your preference for a venue for possible trials for the crime of aggression? Thank you for the questions. Uh, yes, I did note that last week we did make our first contribution to that database. Uh, but certainly to protect the integrity of the, any potential investigations. As you could imagine, I'm not at liberty to, to give details uh, around uh, what has been contributed. Uh, I'm confident it will not be our last, though. As to your question related to uh, the proper form, uh, certainly the United States supports an international tribunal, uh, one that is rooted in Ukrainian law but uh, includes concepts of international law. And we look forward to working with our colleagues in the Ukraine, our partners in the EU, and all other actors uh, to ensure that we have a proper uh, forum to ensure justice and accountability here. Okay, we have two questions which have come in online from Mr. Kostin, one from a um, uh, Ukrainian journalist from Zmina, and one from a Danish journalist. Uh, the first one is, Mr. Kostin, what prevents Ukraine from ratifying the Rome Statute? And the second question to you is, uh, your office has been collecting evidence uh, for the committed crime of ag aggression uh, last year. What evidence is still missing, and how much time do you need to build up a case? Thank you for your questions. First of all, um, my position is absolutely strong that Ukraine will ratify Rome statute and become the part of the family of the members of the Rome Statute and the ICC. I hope that it will be uh, ratified sooner than later. And uh, practically, uh, the, our country is ready to do it. The only question is when the parliament will be ready to vote. I hope that within our very rapid um, development in accession to the European Union, this will be an integral part of the package which Ukraine will ratify and adopt in uh, the nearest future. On the other side, Ukraine has already implemented full set of internal legislation which provide the ICC and the Office of the Prosecutor of the ICC full competence to investigate and prosecute all international crimes committed in Ukraine in course of Russian aggression. And in coming time, I hope that uh, the opening of the field office, official field office of the prosecutor of the ICC in Ukraine, which is already finalized by documentation and in, in, in line with agreement between the Ukrainian government and the ICC is another evidence of the full cooperation of Ukrainian authorities with the Office of Prosecutor Han and the ICC, and our full commitment and transparent and open cooperation with our colleagues from the Office of Pros Prosecutor Han. And I would say that the historic first arrest warrants against Putin and Lvova Bilova is also one of, the, uh, uh, one of the elements of this uh, cooperation and uh, transparency. Uh, to answer to the other question, we launched today the International Center for the Prosecution of the Crime of Aggression. As my colleagues have already uh, mentioned, it's about 
collecting of evidences, it's about exchanging of evidences and information, it's about, uh, it's about engaging experts, world-known experts, who will help us to build the case. And being very pragmatic, I believe that one of the tasks of the group of prosecutors and experts who will work starting from today here in the, ha in the Hague will be not only to exchange evidences, not only to analyze them, but also to build a prosecutorial strategy, how to build the case, and at some stage to prepare drafts of the documents, which could be used then by the tribunal. I hope that this tribunal to uh, prosecute uh, the crime of aggression would be international, because the crime of aggression committed by Russia against Ukraine is the crime against global peace and security. And to fill in the gap in international law, we need an international response. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more question from Deutsche Welle. Not Sorry, the last three questions we can take. Deutsche Welle, please. Uh, Terry Schultz with Deutsche Welle. Um, I wanted to know, I wanted to follow up on that. What, what is the timeline? I, I mean, I know it's, it's hard to say, but toward getting toward this international tribunal, and we don't have any national representatives of the JIT countries here, but is it likely that, that, there will, that the trials will begin in one of those countries first? I, I mean, this, this is working simultaneously, as I understand, creation of an international tribunal and, of course, the national prosecution. So where are we likely to see a first trial and when? Thanks. First of all, let me, uh, let me inform that uh, the Office of Prosecutor General of Ukraine has opened the criminal proceedings in crime of aggression in Ukraine. We have already collected a large number of evidences, and we have already identified more than 600 uh, uh, people who are notified of suspicion in absentia for the crime of aggression against Ukraine, because it's a large number of people who were involved in it. We have already indictments against 312 of them, and have, we have already 20 people convicted. But the idea of tribunal is to reach the highest military and political leadership of Russia, including so-called members of Troika, to be prosecuted on international level. My position is that we need proper tribunal than fast tribunal. So we will proceed communication with all of our partners who believe that crime of aggression was committed and who know that there should be an international response uh, for, to prosecute for this crime. But as we proceed with our communication on legal modalities of such tribunal, we today open our new, new page of uh, uh, creating or launching the International Center for the Prosecution of the Crime of Aggression. So we have no time. In course of war, we start to collect evidences, we start to exchange them on international level to prepare future tribunal to be served with initial information. Um, thank you, Mr. Kostin. Uh, sorry. Maybe I, I want just to say that, uh, first of all, you have uh, the Prosecutor General of No, no, the Prosecutor General of Ukraine uh, is a member, of course, also of the GIT, and we have said that for the first time the ICC is also in the, the JIT, and you know that the coordination is organized by Yurzh, so it's possible to have... I said national representatives, and then I corrected. Yes, but uh, national uh, from a member state, because uh, Ukraine is also national, if I may. So you see that... We have a lot of representatives around this table. But first of all, I want to say that what we are doing now is very exceptional because we are doing that during the war, not after. And so we have started very early, not only to collect evidence, but to organize prosecutions and already some trials at the national level, like in Ukraine, and it will be maybe the same uh, in other countries. And so you ask about the national uh, situation, it will be maybe a decision at the national level to go further with the prosecution and a trial also for the crime of aggression. That is just a decision in the national justice system to do that. About the uh, international situation, first of all, is the importance of the, the event of today. We are starting with the first step. 
uh, we are starting with such a coordination at the international level of all the possible ways to collect evidence and to prepare a robust file for the future trial, because it was said by Andre Costin, we'll work also with some experts to be sure that it's possible to build a solid uh, file. And I want just to add that for the long run, we have said that many times, the best solution will be to go to the ICC. So it's the reason why in my discussions with the member states, with the Minister of Justice of the member states, I have asked to table uh, an amendment to the Rome Statute to give the competence to the ICC. But I'm not sure that it will be with a possible application now, very uh, soon, but we'll see. For the rest, we continue to discuss in a core group with member states and other countries and like-minded partners. We will have this week, again, a discussion in the G7 with our partners in Tokyo. And uh, of course, it's very important to have a very broad international support. From the Commission, we are open to work on all the possible solutions to have a dedicated tribunal to organize a trial about the crime of aggression. But again, we want to be sure that uh, we will have a very large, very broad support from the international community. It's the reason why we continue at the conversations, but we start. And we start with the first layer, the International Center for the Prosecution of the Crime of Aggression. Before to organize a trial, you need to collect evidence, you need to build a solid file, and so we'll continue the discussions on this. But we have said from the beginning, at the Commission level, we are open to work on the different possibilities. Certainly for the long run, to work to give the competence to the ICC. Before that, we have a dedicated tribunal with a very broad international support from many other partners than the member states. Thank you, Mr. Henders. Um, Mr. Costin, you mentioned certain numbers of arrests. The question is coming from the Spanish uh, press agency, EFE. Were those particular arrests just on the crime of aggression, or are they overall numbers of arrests? And, uh, in yeah, once again. This is not about the the arrest. This is about uh, this is about indictments and uh, and cases which are brought to to the courts. And uh, as I mentioned, all of them are done unfortunately in absentia because uh, these uh, people are uh, still in in, in Russia. Uh, with regard to all uh, the uh, number of war crimes, uh, uh, the other war crimes as we have at the moment, we have uh, at the moment registered uh, more than 93,000 incidents of war crimes. And in course of war, our national system is working hard. So for other war crimes, we have 347 people who has been notified of suspicion. And we have indictments against 207 people which are brought to court. And we have already 53 perpetrators has been convicted for different war crimes committed on Ukrainian soil and against Ukrainians. Thank you for this clarification. We have a question here in the front. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, Could you use the microphone, please? Thank you. Uh, about the international crime of aggression, uh, the, the crime of aggression and the international tribunal, I see that there are um, different points of view because uh, Ukrainian position is clear. You are insisting that it should be a proper international uh, tribunal. Sorry, my name is Ksenia Polska. I'm from Ukraine. I forgot to um, <laughs> introduce myself. But um, uh, a senior uh, EU official mentioned uh, that at the level of G7, uh, there is rather an opinion that a hybrid uh, trib tribunal would be a more realistic option right now. And uh, as I heard uh, from what you said, Mr. Polite, that you also mentioned some kind of an international uh, tribunal, but based on the Ukrainian jurisdiction. So um, can I get... Um, a scope or maybe a flavor of where this discussion is right now on the level of G7. Uh, maybe, Mr. Polite, you could answer that question. When you said uh, based on Ukrainian jurisdiction, did you mean exactly the, a hybrid tribunal um, or was it rather uh, something else? Thank you. I'm, so, I'm sorry, May, Please just one. Let's forget the word hybrid because there could be no hybrid accountability for real crimes. Use some other wording, mm -hmm. okay? Like what? <laughs> Special Tribunal for the Crime of Aggression. Dedicated. Special Tribunal for the Crime of Aggression. Mm -hmm.
And again, I, I, I completely agree with my colleagues here. And uh, as Prosecutor General Colston said, we want to get it right, not get it fast. And so we are open to having those important conversations, uh, continuing in the G7, as you've already heard, but in ensuring that we ultimately arrive at the absolute appropriate forum to address justice and accountability here. Uh, as I mentioned already, we have very uh, intensive and very open discussions with all of our partners and friends. And I believe that we will find common solution which will be in line with the position of Ukrainians who believe that incumbent, uh, m incumbent President, Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs Russia should be prosecuted for the crime of aggression. This is very important. And uh, we believe that we will find this solution because we need this tribunal to be internationally credible. Thank you, Mr. Kostin. One very last question from Reuters uh, before we conclude this press conference. Sorry, Stephanie Vandenberg from Reuters. I have a question for Mr. Khan about the cooperation uh, with this uh, ICPA. Um, the U.S. has seconded a prosecutor. Can we expect the secondment also of ICC personnel to the center? Will you be sharing all of the evidence you have collected? Will it be a selection? And uh, Mr. Randers opened the door kind of for the, also the possibility of maybe at some point an aggression prosecution at the ICC. Do you see that also as a possible end point? And then maybe also for Mr. Polite, would the, IC, uh, would the U.S. accept an ICC prosecution for the crime of aggression in the situation for Ukraine? Well, uh, Stephanie, you're, you're very canny. You asked three questions under the guise of, of, of one to three different people. So um, I, I'll answer it in the way that I think fit. Um, you know, I think uh, the first point is, I, I, I'll back up a little bit. I, I do think today's a significant day. Uh, I do give Ukraine actually quite a lot of credit that the first time that I've seen anywhere that I can recall in the way that things have panned out, that in the middle of conflict and such a violent conflict, um, there is a focus on justice. It's not simply survival or territorial gains, but the United for Justice uh, conference that President Zelensky uh, headlined, that Attorney General Merrick Garland attended in Lviv, that uh, the, the commission was present at, that I was present at, it, it is just an illustration that there is an effort, maybe imperfect, but there's a real effort to make sure that the law is on the front lines and is, um, we utilize it to the maximum of its ability. We all understand the law has massive latent potential, but the challenge is trying to make it being felt by those that need it uh, in a way that uh, will vindicate, actually, the survivors of the Holocaust and all other conflicts that have taken place since. Uh, in terms of the organization, already we are you know, a participant in the JIT, we attend the, the JIT meetings. I think the secondment were a bit different because we're based in The Hague. Uh, I don't think we second somebody, but we're here at all the meetings. We have a representation here. We're part of those discussions. And the way I would look at it is previously there were three draws, um, you know, in terms of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes, uh, in which the various streams of information could run, and one was locked. And the crime of aggression that is under the uh, domestic laws of various member states, Ukraine and uh, other members of Eurojust, and which is an activated crime under the Rome Statute, but for which there are jurisdictional impediments, that draw is now opened and the information can be filtered, can be, you know, can be put in there and analyzed, ready for whenever a national authority under its own sovereign will and the independent prosecutors decide to activate it and move forward, the Prosecutor General of Ukraine has given examples, or whether or not there can be further amendments to the Rome Statute. Now, of course, the law is not static. The law is constant. The beauty of the law is it can innovate, it can be principles and adapt to the needs of humanity, uh, not just states and political interests, but a core need. And the crime of aggression, of course, is one of the foundational principles of the UN Charter. So um, the, I think the Commissioner Rain does put it very well that. Um, the, uh, an amendment, it seems, will be tabled by um, some states to amend the Rome Statute in a way that the law can be applied consistently, because that also is very important to my mind for the integrity of the law 
that it binds as many people as possible, and this can be a starting point, but it can't be a starting and finishing point over the boundaries of Ukraine. It needs to be, in my view, uh, an effort to make sure the law is applied more equally, more consistently, as widely you know, as possible. So I think that definitely um, is a prospect, but that's for others to decide. We're applying the law we can. And certainly, already under the Rome Statute, under 9310, we can share information with any national authority, state parties or non-state parties alike, in order to make sure there's more space for justice and less space for impunity. Now, we're not legally obliged. You know, we can receive the benefits of the JIT, but we are also a uh, unique, we're a participant of the JIT. It's down to us and based upon our statutory responsibilities what information we, sell, we, we share. We're working very closely with uh, uh, the Prosecutor General of Ukraine. I think that is to be commended. The men and women of Ukraine in his office are working in the most perilous circumstances. I mean, many of you journalists uh, and your colleagues have been there as the shells are falling. It's, it's, it really is. Um, uh, you know, there's been great, very courageous reporting, but the, the investigators and prosecutors of Ukraine and members, men and women of my office, are working in a battle zone in a way that is, presents unique challenges. But unless we collect and preserve the evidence, the hope of accountability that is as wide as possible for as many core crimes under the Rome Statute as possible will become theoretical and illusionary. And of course, whether it's human rights or the Rome Statute, what we're trying to do collectively is make sure these concepts are rendered practical and effective. They're taken off the page of academic journals and are, you know, are there, plant the flag of justice on the soil of Ukraine and actually spread it more widely as well. Because one thing we've seen, if there are these, you know, um, a la carte menu that I've referred to previously in which um, in different theatres of conflict the law can be viewed as an optional extra, it's going to undoubtedly lead to more insecurity, more instability, and we need more stability, more security, and therefore more justice. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Polito. There was a question to you as well. The question was if, uh, uh, if it does happen that the ICC gets an amendment that they could try uh, the crime of uh, aggression uh, under their statute with the, uh, if, in the case of Ukraine, would the U.S. support that prosecution of the crime of aggression as well in the same way that you support an internationalized tribunal? Well, I'm not going to speculate at this time as to what that response may be, may be, but I will tell you that the Department of Justice has taken the position that the ICC's charges and uh, arrest warrants uh, against Putin were justified. Uh, and as I said at the outset, we are supporting all efforts, whether by the ICC, whether by national, regional, international actors in this space, who are all fighting to ensure accountability and justice against Russia for perpetrating this war of aggression against Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. Philippe. Mr. Hamran, you would like to react as well? Um, yes, uh, thank you so much, because I understand that the focus of the discussion is much more about the new tribunal, uh, and which will, will be special hybrid or whatever um, uh, nature it will have. Uh, in my opinion, um, this, this is uh, um, not important at this stage uh, in where uh, the, the, the trial will happen. Um, while the negotiations are still ongoing, uh, we, will, um, we will definitely follow those investigations or th those discussions. However, um, as far as investigation of the crime of aggression, it's important that we start now. In the past, all uh, aggression-related investigations have started after the conflict. So uh, when uh, you uh, clearly had uh, those uh, who are uh, winners and uh, who uh, had to capitulate, uh, we are doing this for the first time uh, as uh, the conflict uh, happens. Uh, also, um, as it was mentioned, this is uh, a first uh, aggression-related investigation after the Second World War. And uh, again, the circumstances are uh, completely different. Uh, today, uh, we have a huge amount of evidence uh, which is available in different jurisdictions. And I keep saying, never in the history uh, we had more evidence um, about uh, the aggression as we have today. We are speaking about uh, different videos, uh, aerial photography, uh, uh, GPS. Um, we intercepted communication. 
um, um, data on mobile phones and this and so on. Um, all this requires a huge effort. This is why uh, we have to um, join other forces and to support the national investigations because they are confronted with unparalleled, um, actually challenged. Um, and um, for the, uh, it, to have the uh, investigation uh, concerning the crime of aggression, it's a big thing. Uh, first of all, you have to prove the aggression. And this can be done, for example, uh, through evidence of uh, bombardments, uh, blockage of ports, uh, attacks by armed forces on land, uh, sea, and air. Now you see the scope of, of the challenge, uh, because you, see, you know how many uh, different incidents uh, actually happened uh, in, in uh, Ukraine. But um, uh, the, uh, the, the evidence concerning bombardments or blockage of ports and this and so on is not enough. We have to also link all these attacks uh, with certain uh, people uh, who are in the leader, leading position, uh, either in the political leadership or military leadership. And this will be another big uh, challenge uh, ahead of us, because we have to ensure that, first of all, we have admissible evidence. Secondly, that uh, we have um, all elements of crime properly documented. And then the third one will be uh, that uh, we will evaluate, assess all the evidence, translate those evidence into two languages, and prepare a truly international file for either domestic courts or international courts, whether present or uh, future. Uh, so I think it's uh, very important to understand uh, the, the scope, uh, why we are doing here, what we are doing here, and why believe uh, that uh, what is happening now, it's so exceptional. Thank you, Mr. Hamran. A last reaction from Mr. Kostin, please. Yeah. Dear colleagues, you see here the unity of us. The unity is very wide. As Kenneth yesterday told, it's a diversity even of unity. And we are united in order to ensure full accountability for all crimes committed, including the crime of aggression. If crime of aggression should not have been committed, there would be no other 93,000 incidents of war crimes. And this day today, for me, and I believe for my colleagues, is an evidence that establishment of special tribunal for the crime of aggression is now inevitable. It will be established because we start our work today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Costin. Thank you to all speakers and thank you all here uh, for your attendance and those who followed online.